Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for coming to this presentation. So the way this is going to work is basically I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes about the level design in Trainyard, and then Semyon from Zepto Lab is going to talk for about 25 minutes about Cut the Rope, and then afterwards we're going to open it up for some questions. Uh, because this is the last session, we'll have a bit more time for questions if there are some. All right, so this is a level design post-mortem, and really what, that, what I'm going to be doing is just kind of giving my level design philosophy I followed when creating Train Yard. Uh, so my name is Matt Ricks, uh, and I live kind of outside of Toronto, so that's me, but really what I want to talk about is Train Yard. So uh, to give you the super brief story of the game, in 2010, I was working at an advertising agency as a Flash developer, and I was getting really sick of my job, and I, I've always loved games, but I'd never actually made one. And so I decided to make a game in my spare time. So every day on the train to work, and whenever I could find time, I would work on this game. And over the course of a year, I did all the parts and finished it all up and released it on the App Store. And uh, so it came out. And at first, it didn't really do that well. Um, so for, for, for a few months, everyone seemed to love it, but the sales weren't very high. And then I released Train Yard Express, which is the free version, and the game got a whole ton of buzz. And uh, through a variety of, of different things, it climbed all the way up the App Store to number two, uh, actually behind Only Cut the Rope. And it stayed there for a few months in October of 2010. And since then, it's kind of dropped down. Um, I don't know if anyone was in Phil Hassey's talk a couple days ago, but I really liked how he gave out some, some real sales numbers. So. Uh, Train Yard is priced at 99 cents, and to date it's been bought over 800,000 times. And, uh, and the free version, Train Yard Express, has been downloaded over 4.2 million times. So for something I made in my spare time, and for pretty much the first game I've ever made, it's been pretty amazing, really. Um, so that's the story of the game, but now let's talk about the actual gameplay. Train Yard is a logical puzzle game. The, uh, the only thing you do is draw tracks for the trains to follow. That's it. So the way it works, uh, on the left there's a blue station, on the right there's a yellow station. The trains are going to come out and follow those tracks and combine to form a green train. So color theory plays a huge role in the game, and the timing and mixing of trains, whether they either crash or don't crash, uh, plays into it. Now again, the only thing you do is draw tracks. There are no points, there are no scores. Literally the only thing that matters is solving puzzles. So that's the basics of how the game works. But again, this is about level design. So level design, to me, is all about teaching. Uh, it, you can almost look at each level as a lesson and the overall flow of the game as a course. You're teaching the player how your mechanics work. You're trying to get to a point where you've taught the player how to become a master at your game, how to be an expert at your game. And so that was what I was always trying to do throughout the course of the level design in Train Yard. And as a teacher, your most important consideration is really knowing who your students are. So in the case of Train Yard, despite the fact that it's kind of like a hardcore logical puzzle game, I was aiming it at the, the very casual App Store audience. Um, and so that, that had a number of implications for my level design. I think there's this sort of perception out there that casual players are, are somehow like less intelligent or dumber than, than average players. And I don't think that's actually the case at all. I, I simply think it's the fact that uh, they haven't been playing games their whole lives, and so they're missing out on all this experience and this whole vocabulary of games that most of us just take for granted. And so because of the, the fact that they don't have that vocabulary, I needed to take the level design in Train Yard and start it from a much more base level to make sure that they really understood all the core concepts. If you're making a game that's targeted at actual, like, hardcore gamers, you can skip a lot of the steps that I made sure to include in Train Yard. Uh, all right, so as a StarCraft player, I like to break everything down into micro and macro. So in the case of Train Yard, I see micro, or sorry, in the case of level design, I see micro as being the, the specifics, the individual design of actual single puzzles. And then macro being the overall flow of the game, the way that all the levels fit together and kind of the difficulty curve of the game. So first of all, I want to talk about macro. Uh, one of the most important things I was trying to do was to add elements progressively, making sure that I was only teaching one single thing at any given time. Uh, so an element could be something like a gameplay mechanic, it could be some sort of technique, some sort of way of using the current elements in the, in the game, or it could be almost some new form of practice to teach the player how to use the elements that they already know. Uh, and along with that, I also wanted to 
to treat combinations of elements as if they were a new element. And I'll, I'll have these diagrams that hopefully make that more clear. So in, in traditional um, gamer-focused games, you have this sort of approach to teaching elements a lot of the time. So you teach element A, and the next level you have element A, and then you introduce element B, and the next level you have A, B, and then you introduce element C. And there you go, you've got your levels. But in Train Yard, because of the casual audience, I wanted to break it really down to a more granular level. So I would teach A, and then teach B in isolation, and then teach A and B together, and then teach C in isolation, and then give them an example with A and C, and B and C, and finally come to the end when there's A, B, and C. Now, obviously mathematically looking at this, a couple more elements and you're ending up with, with thousands of puzzles. So it's not practical to do this, but at least taking this sort of approach to level design, really breaking it down to the granular parts and making sure the players actually understand all the nitty gritty uh, things that you're trying to teach them. Okay, so instructions are a big thing in game. And uh, George Fan had a fantastic talk this morning about this in Plants vs. Zombies. And I kind of have a few similar takes on it here. So uh, in early versions of Train Yard, there was kind of a wall of text teaching how to play the game. And that was totally ineffective. No one really reads text. And so I was trying to figure out what approach to take, and I ended up looking at things like this. So this is the, uh, an Ikea, like page from an Ikea manual. And I think we can all agree that most of our games are probably easier to do than assembling a piece of IKEA furniture. And so I figured if this works for them, this will probably work for games. And I discovered that, in fact, games like Angry Birds, there's a picture, there's no text there, and yet you can understand how to play this relatively complex physics game with a single picture. So it's really, really powerful. And uh, there's actually a couple other benefits to this. Um, or there's one big benefit, and it's that localization becomes less important because all of a sudden anyone from any culture can understand how to play your game just from seeing a single picture. Uh, so there's, one, there's something I like to call the wingdings test, which is where you take a game, replace all the font files in the game with wingdings, and then give the game to someone who's never played it before. And if they can understand it with all that nonsense text there, then you know that you've got a game that is no longer dependent on text at all. And that's, that's actually a really fun test to do. Uh, all right, so with Train Yard, it's much more complex than a game like Angry Birds. I couldn't just simply show them a picture and, and have them understand how the game works. And, and the best way to show someone how a game works is to show it actually being played. On iOS, file size is a premium because of kind of the 3G download limits, and so I needed to do something else. And what I ended up doing was this sort of system. So uh, this is the tutorial, just like one screen from the tutorial system, and it's it runs on top of the actual game itself, and it's kind of, uh, I spent like two months of my development time just making this tutorial system alone. It's really robust, XML driven, very uh, adaptable, and it's running on top of the real game engine. So there's, there's this super ugly hand you can see on the right screen. That hand fires real touch events into the game and does exactly what a player does when their finger touches the screen. Um, and you can see that I've used text there, but the text is only there to add some context and some terminology. It's definitely not necessary to understand the game at all. And they can actually watch the game being played and see all the techniques being done. Uh, only teaching the player what they need to know. This is, uh, George also touched on this this morning, but front-loading everything that you can do in your game all at once is not a good way to teach the player. Uh, they, they don't know, if you're getting all these instructions right up front or all these tutorials, how do they know which thing they're actually going to need to know right now? There's no way of them choosing. So they just choose one thing to focus on, and it could be the totally wrong element that, that they actually don't need to know at all. Um, something else that can happen is that you teach them everything up front, and then you have this whole game for hours and hours and hours, and all of a sudden they get to some super hard level in the game, and you have this element that you only taught them at the beginning of the game, and they've long since forgotten it. Uh, so this, the easiest way to solve this is just to split your tutorials out over the course of the game. And uh, in the case of Train Yard, when you start it up, the first tutorial is literally teaching the player to drag their finger across the screen, and that's it. And then they have a few puzzles to let them practice that. Then there's another tutorial, and it teaches them how to drag their finger in a corner shape. And then there's a few more puzzles to let them practice. The last tutorial doesn't come to over 70 puzzles into the game, like three quarters through. And, uh, and so they've been playing for five or six hours, but it spreads it all out so that they know what they need to know at a given time. 
Um, this seems similar, but it's actually kind of different. So you can teach players things through tutorials, or you can teach things through gameplay. But it's important that players have an opportunity to actually practice those things and try them more than once. If you teach someone in a tutorial, then you have a level that uses that tutorial or uses that skill, uh, but then you never come back to it for the rest of the game. And then all of a sudden, I see a lot of games do this. They'll teach something right up front, and then you get to the end of the game, and all of a sudden there's this ultra-hard puzzle at the end of the game, and it uses that element, and you haven't actually seen it for hours and hours and hours. Uh, so I think it's, it's important to come back to things over the course of the game. Make sure you're giving them a chance to practice things, not just when you teach them, but come back to them over the course of the game again and again. So this is uh, just an abstraction of the sort of difficulty curve I was trying to follow when I created Train Yard. So you have this ramping up in difficulty, and then uh, every few levels you drop it off and give them kind of a break. And this is just... Uh, having a constant ramp in difficulty can be incredibly overwhelming for a player. You never really get that chance to relax. And so these dips just give them the chance to kind of chill out and do something and feel good about solving something that's easier. They feel uh, kind of content that they actually have some skill and some mastery over the game. And like I was talking about in that previous slide, these kind of dips in the, in the difficulty curve give you a great chance to go back to some earlier mechanics, some simpler mechanics, and make sure they still really understand them and have an opportunity to practice them. So level unlocking is one of the things in Train Yard that's uh, probably one of the things I'm least proud of. It's, so the way it works is kind of confusing to explain, which is pretty much a, a given fact that it's actually too confusing in general. But uh, So each puzzle is assigned a number of stars based on how difficult it is. So an easy puzzle, one or two, a medium puzzle, four or five, a hard puzzle, nine or ten, whatever. Uh, and then when they solve those puzzles, they're given that number of stars, and then with certain number of stars, it unlocks the next section of puzzles. And yesterday I was actually talking to Semyon about this, and Cut the Rope has something very similar, but the difference is that in Cut the Rope, every puzzle is worth three stars, and in Train Yard, they're worth variable amounts. And I think some players, it wasn't a huge deal, but I think some players really got confused by the fact that they didn't really understand where these stars were coming from. And that could actually just be an issue in my communication of it, more than an actual problem in the game design itself. So something that happened a lot, because I had this unlocking mechanism, um, I would get a lot of emails from players that said, you know, I got, a new, I got a new iPad, I got a new iPhone, and for some reason iTunes screwed up my data and I can't, I can't get it, and so I have to start over from the beginning, and I really don't want to have to play all these easy puzzles again. And at first I was kind of like, I don't know what to do, you know, the easy puzzles are easy, just go through them, I guess. And then I realized there was a really easy solution, and it was just to put a button on the option screen that when you press it, it allows you to unlock all the puzzles. It says, are you sure you want to do this? And if you do, you just have the whole game available to you. It's really like, uh, like a cheat code from an old school game, except instead of making a cheat code, some obscure thing, it's just right there in options if you want to do it. And this solved so many problems with like syncing and all that, and it took me probably an hour to code in, or not even that much. It was uh, like a huge uh, amount of effort for the amount of actual results it got. It was really awesome. Something else that worked uh, really well was having a main game and then bonus levels. So in Train Yard, there are 100 main puzzles in the game that, that kind of constitute the main game. And what happens is when you finish those 100 puzzles, a screen pops up and it says, congratulations, you beat the game. And then you can post it on Twitter and Facebook. And then right down below that, there's a little button that says, want more puzzles? Play the bonus puzzles. And to me, the real game is in the bonus puzzles. There's 60 more puzzles and they take way more time and way more effort, and they're, they're much more interesting puzzles. But uh, a lot of the reason I, I did this was because I knew a lot of casual players, and this is exactly what ended up happening, a lot of casual players would get to that screen where I said you beat the game, and they would kind of close Train Yard and be completely content with how far they got. And so those players left the game really happy, and if I ever make like a Train Yard 2 or something, they'll be big fans of it. And then the hardcore players who are the ones who are better at the game than I am anyway, they would go into the bonus levels and have a blast playing all these super hard levels. So this, this worked pretty well, except there was one issue that I didn't really consider, and it was this um, kind of mystery demographic. So there's the casual players and the hardcore players, but what I didn't realize is there was, this also, there was also this demographic, which I kind of realized afterwards that I fall into this demographic myself, and it's the players who just want to complete everything. They're not necessarily the best players at the game, but they want to complete everything you throw at them anyway. And so 
what was happening is that the casual players were happy, the hardcore players were happy, but I made uh, one kind of fatal mistake, and that was that every puzzle I made, I put, not every puzzle, but every kind of hard puzzle I made, I put it in the game. So I had some puzzles where I had spent uh, like five, six, seven, eight hours solving them and finally solved them. And there were these like insanely hard puzzles that I put at the very end of the bonus puzzles. And so these completionist players would go through all the bonus puzzles and then get to these insanely hard puzzles and just get frustrated and quit because they're literally puzzles that I myself struggled with. And, uh, and the hardcore players would still solve them anyway. So I came to a, an easy solution, and it's basically just don't put those puzzles in the game at all. The uh, casual player will be happy, completionist player are happy, and the hardcore player, they won't be happy no matter what you do. So, uh, so what's the point, really? No, but uh, I actually found another solution to the hardcore player, and that is creating a level editor. And so I did that uh, much later on, and that was actually a huge success, and all the hardcore players are happy, so now everyone's happy, and it's all good times. All right, uh, so now moving on to micro, the specifics of individual puzzles. Each level needs to have a purpose. Uh, so when I was, any time I would kind of have a blank slate there in front of me, I would know what I wanted to accomplish with that puzzle before I put any pieces on the board. Um, so kind of like what I was talking about earlier, uh, a purpose could be like teaching some sort of element, uh, some sort of mechanic, giving them practice. Or it could be some sort of theme, some sort of idea I wanted to evoke through the design of the puzzle. So there's a lot of different approaches that can, that can be done there, but the important thing is that you know what you're going to do um, before the actual creation of it. And visually, I really like to aim for symmetry and balance. I want everything in the puzzles to look intentional, to be, uh, well, let me just show you an example. So this is a puzzle um, called Magic Carpet, for some reason. And, uh, so you can see there's kind of a diagonal symmetry there with the rainbow effect. And really the reason I do this and the reason I have that kind of symmetry and balance there is that I want everything, every puzzle I make, I want it to look handcrafted. I want it to look like someone spent a lot of time and effort actually making this puzzle. Uh, I don't want it to look procedurally generated like some sort of algorithm just spit out another puzzle for the player to play. I really want it to be just like human. And uh, so that's, that's why I go with that. Now, yeah, I'll show another example for this. So, so this is one of the player-made puzzles. Um, kind of all my examples of bad puzzles are from player-made puzzles. So, but, uh, so this doesn't really have that symmetry. It doesn't really have that balance to it. But the thing that really bugs me about it is that rock in the middle of the screen. Rocks in train yards serve one basic purpose, and that's to limit where you can draw tracks and it limits your solution pace, space for the puzzle. And it can be incredibly powerful, uh, incredibly powerful way of making the player think in certain ways and use certain techniques. But in this case, it just kind of gets in their way. It doesn't make the puzzle any more interesting. It doesn't make the puzzle require any more cleverness. It just makes the puzzle take longer to solve. And one of the benefits of Train Yard, or one of the greatest things about the, the, the gameplay mechanics, is the fact that there are many possible solutions for every single puzzle, but all of a sudden this rock just kind of gets in there and restricts their solution face, but doesn't make the puzzle any more fun or anything. So really not a big fan of just arbitrary elements thrown everywhere. Uh, using themes, so this is a puzzle called Cooksville Creek, and it is meant to evoke the feeling of a river. Now unfortunately I don't have a video of it in action, but if you can imagine, a blue train will flow from the top down to the bottom and then split into four blue trains and then flow to the left side and to the right side and across the bottom and finally up to the top right. Um, now you don't really have to visualize in your mind, but the important thing is that it has this kind of blue flow throughout and I was trying to evoke the feeling of a river. And there's no real perfect reason for that. The only thing is I just wanted to look handcrafted. I wanted it to look like someone took the time and effort to make something interesting. So this don't overwhelm the player. So this is another player-made puzzle. And anyone who's playing Train Yard instantly is going like, what is that? Because it's, there's like 60 trains there and 60 goals, and it's just an overwhelming amount of information. And the way I, I kind of like to look at this is that each player, I almost think of it like a computer or something, every single player of a game has a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of state that they can hold in their brain at any given time. 
And if you're, if you're starting with too many elements on the board, it could be the easiest puzzle in the world to, to actually do the solution of, but if you're starting with too many elements on the board, they're just gonna get overwhelmed and confused with the amount of information. And so whenever possible, I like to use the absolute minimum number of elements I can to get whatever purpose I'm trying to achieve across. There's no point in throwing more things in just because I can. I really wanna keep everything to the absolute minimum necessary. Um, when, when beta testing or, or when watching someone else play the game, if you ever hear someone say, I don't know how I just solved that puzzle, or if you're watching someone and they start devolving into trial and error, to me, like, a bit of trial and error, like educated trial and error is fine, but when they, it just straight up trial and error, that's like the ultimate bad thing for a puzzle game, because they might as well not be able to solve the puzzle at all. And so that either means there's some problem with your core gameplay mechanics, or much more likely, that your difficulty curve up to that point and your levels up to that point aren't teaching the player the skills they actually need to know to solve that puzzle. So that's a huge problem, uh, at least in my mind, that's a huge problem that needs to be solved somehow. So having a level editor, um, so this is the train yard level, it's like this super ugly Adobe Flex thing, but it works for creating puzzles and it's visual, which is great, but the most important thing you can have in a level editor, at least in my mind, is some form of versioning. You need a way that you can quickly clone and duplicate puzzles and try out experiments, and if they don't work, you can go back to whatever you were doing before. Um, and another thing that's really important is being able to switch between solving the puzzle and creating the puzzle as quickly as possible, or a level if you're making level-based game, whatever. You need some way that you can quickly swap between them. If you're waiting for compile times or something like that, it's gonna drastically, amount, uh, it's gonna drastically impact the amount of experiment, experimentation and iteration that you're actually willing to do. And finally, I want to talk about making players happy. So when you're creating a, a puzzle game, players love, or human beings in general, love solving puzzles. We love figuring things out. So there's no reason to go overkill with uh, like experience points and all kinds of blinky things on screen all the time. You don't need to do that because players love the fact that they're solving things and figuring things out. The only thing I really tried to do is when the player's already feeling that, that kind of internal joy from solving something, I like to amplify it. So in Train Yard, when you solve a puzzle, that's when I go crazy with particle effects and sound effects and all that sort of stuff to really uh, kind of lock in the feeling the player is having. And finally, discovery of untaught mechanics. So a lot of this has just been about teaching things kind of explicitly. But the most powerful thing you can do as a level designer is give the opportunity to the player to figure things out themselves. So this is that puzzle color theory from the start of the game. And uh, color theory is interesting because it comes 20 levels into the game and up to this point I've, I haven't ever told the player that colors can mix together. I haven't shown them that, that that's possible at all. And so I put them in this situation where they can do nothing else but discover this mechanic. And I think that's the key thing is that if you're making gamer-focused games, uh, it's pretty easy to, to kind of assume they have some knowledge and can figure things out. But for casual players, they can get frustrated really quickly uh, and think that there's just some knowledge that they're missing to solve a puzzle. So you need to kind of give them the minimum amount of, of information, not information, but a minimum amount of room to work in. It's almost like you don't want to give them too much rope. Um, and so that's what I was trying to do here. And this, this specific puzzle I've heard so much feedback from people about how this kind of, this was the moment where the game changed for them, when they discovered this for themselves. All right, so wrapping up, um, that's basically all I have to say. Now, I, I hope some people can find this useful, not just for puzzle games, but for any kind of level games. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thanks for listening, and that's my stuff. Now, Semyon's gonna come up. Yeah. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Semyon. I'm a creative director and co-founder of Zepto Lab. And I will continue Matt's uh, talk on the level design from the perspective of our game Cut the Rope. And I will also uh, share some uh, sources of information that we rely on uh, when we're trying to analyze what are the things that we did uh, right and what, what could be better. Uh, and it will take another 25 minutes, I mean, my part overall, and then uh, Matt and I will answer your questions. So in case you haven't heard about Cut the Rope, it's a uh, pretty popular uh, game which was initially released for mobile platforms. 
and it happened around one and a half year ago. And it's it's built around really simple principle of delivering object from point A to point B by cutting the ropes in some specific order and with the right timing. And you can see how the uh, game evolved from the very early draft to the final look. And you can see that point B ended up being this green, feature, uh, green creature called Om Nom. And, uh, because the game was originally intended for mobile devices, it uses a really short session approach with the, uh, with the levels. So many levels, or even most of them, can be really completed in several seconds. So game can be really considered a snack of gaming. And those snacks are the levels. And our job as designers, as level designers, to make sure that those snacks are tasty. So in order to do that, we've set three goals from the very beginning. And first of first goal is that we want players to feel smart. Uh, it doesn't mean that they aren't, but we want to remind them about it. That's the kind of purpose of our game overall. The second goal is that we want to, uh, we want to appear to a really wide audience of the player, from hardcore to the very casual, like the one you can see on the picture. And the third goal is that we want players to feel hungry for more. And that's essential for us to keep the game high in the charts. All right, so we defined the goals. Now we needed some set of principles we would use to, uh, while creating the levels. And there are seven of them, and I will now go through all seven. So the first one is the positive reinforcement. And it's not a big surprise that it works much better than the negative one. And in this example, if you play the game, you know that you can move that um, blue holder uh, on this blue rail. And if you, on the first picture, if you move it really fast uh, to the right side, the rope will pull the candy up, and it will do this kind of jump and uh, end up uh, in the mouth of the little green monster. So in the first example, we kind of forcing player to, to do this trick by placing the spikes there. Uh, however, the better way of doing it would be placing the stars there. So uh, first, it would be a positive uh, motivation for the player. It would encourage uh, him or she or her to do this trick rather than forcing. And uh, what's, what, what's even better that then player will have an option of not collecting, collecting the star at all. And that's, that really uh, helps us with the goal of appealing to the wide audience. Because you know many kids don't really care about the stars. Uh, the, all they want to do is to see uh, Om Nom happy. So uh, it, it, it's good to have several of options for different uh, kind of audience. And what, what's even greater about the, the stars is that it, it's really a self-manageable difficulty within your game. It's up to player to decide what, like, how hard the game uh, should be for him, uh, whether he wants to collect all the stars or just complete the levels. And, it's, and, and you know, also all of those kind of players will feel satisfaction because they've set the goal for themselves and they achieved it. And uh, to give uh, even more value to the stars, we've introduced this, uh, this um, functionality of the level box as being unlocked by some specific amount of stars. And we made sure that, uh, of course, those values are not too high, so unless, level, uh, unless player is skipping too many levels, uh, he'll be able to collect the necessary amount of the stars. And by the way, skipping the levels is another cool thing that we got out of the system. We basically uh, let players skip any, any amount of the levels uh, he wants, uh, of course, unless he hits the, the, next, the next level box, which helps to minimize the frustration of you know, being stuck and, at some particular level. So the next principle is um, that when player launches the, the level, he should already be able to plan the solution. And so what's overall the beauty of the physics-based like, games is that players already know the biggest bunch of the rules from the real physical world. And that's the reason why even small kids can play this kind of games, because they, they don't know the math, they don't know the physics, but they know how these things uh, work around them, right? Uh, so the only thing, the only additional thing that we, we basically need to explain to the player is cutting the ropes, and they already get it from the title of the game. So that's pretty cool. And, uh, but, but here's the tricky part. Even though our physics engine is pretty cool, and we're proud of it, of course it's not as complex, as not detailed, not as detailed as the real life. 
So it is possible to trigger some events within the levels which would, wouldn't look natural or would look unexpected to the player. So our job is to make sure that such things don't happen. And as a proof, you can see this picture taken actually from the YouTube video where apparently one of the game fans have replicated several levels from the game, like in the real world, and it seems to work. You can check the video on YouTube. And just to give you a bit more details on this principle, here's another example where it, basically it's not only about the physical behavior of the objects, it's also about how we put the uh, object within the level. And in this example, the candy floats up in a bubble. And on the first picture, it's not very clear whether it will you know, squeeze between those spikes or not. So uh, the better way of doing it would be either moving the spikes further away so that it will be absolutely clear that the uh, candy will pass, or moving them really close to each other, or maybe even uniting them. So it will clearly communicate that the candy won't pass. We can go as far as you know, placing a little gamble there, but it might be a bit of an overkill. And uh, here's the principle that uh, Matt also talked about. Um, basically, it's not only about that the solution should feel logical, it's also that the wrong way of solving the level should feel wrong. And um, we've seen many times when we were doing playtesting, when uh, some player was, uh, was playing some level and trying some wrong way of solving it over and over and over again, and wasn't even considering the, the optional, the alternative ways of solving it. And that happened because that, that wrong way of solving wasn't communicating uh, clear enough that you know, it's the wrong way. It, was, it, it had a feeling that I almost did it last time, so I'll give it another try. So it should communicate something like, you tried that, good job, didn't work, try something else. And uh, in a way, it, it limited uh, about, it, 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 it a bit limited our game with the amount of solutions every level has. So it's not a really a sandbox approach. There are usually just one or few um, ways of solving the level levels, and uh, there are some good and bad things about it, and the good is that we can really control the experience of the player. All right, and here's another thing is that uh, no game is perfect, including cut the rope, of course, and um, it is possible to trigger some visual glitches, some technical bugs, some control controlling issues uh, by placing some elements in some not really smart way. So we need to make sure that it doesn't happen. And in this example, again, with the blue rope holder, if the rope is really short and player wants to cut it, he can accidentally move the blue holder instead of cutting it. And that's a bad experience. So at some point we agreed that we would, uh, we would set some minimum amount of the ropes attached to such holder and we won't use any shorter ropes. And it already solved uh, this kind of problems in, in many levels. Another thing is that as we have a reset button on the top right corner of the screen, we uh, don't want the player to do any actions like popping the bu bubble or pressing some I know, like air cushions um, within the level because he can uh, occasionally press the reset button and that's again not a, not a good game experience. So we're trying to make sure it doesn't happen. Another thing that uh, Matt talked about is that, um, well, of course, everyone knows that the tutorial is a, is a very important part, and I agree with Matt that images are working even better than text. But another important thing here is that we realize that if we're just uh, like trying to explain something to the player, but um, there's still a space for completing the level without using that principle or using that gameplay element that we're showing. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes players will just skip it and, uh, and then they'll get frustrated later when they'll need this knowledge. So basically people need a reason to learn. And uh, in our case, the uh, reason is usually that they can't complete the level until they try what, what, they, what we want them to try. And uh, in, in most of cases they don't really need to read the text. They can just play around with the, uh, with the object and they'll find out how it works. And here is the most important principle, um, and you'll see the, the proof for that principle uh, in our game, in our levels quite a lot. Uh, it's okay to ignore any of the principles. Uh, and um, the, the only uh, requirement here is that there should be a reason for that. And in our case, a reason is usually 
some cool combinations or combination of the objects or some cool idea and the benefits of having it the, the coolness factor of it is much higher than the than the harm that it causes by violating some of those principles so it's okay we, we think uh, it's okay to, to break the rules and in many cases it works for good so that's it for the principles I also wanted to um, share some um, some things that we do with the level ordering um, and this this spreadsheet might look a bit complicated but we kind of got used to it so it's really a good visual tool for us to see how the levels are going it basically has the list of the levels the list of the gameplay objects uh, like elements and we can see which objects uh, which object is used in which level how the um, the, the how the unlocking rate looks by this gray area you can see the tutorial levels you can variate the arcade and puzzle kind of levels so it's pretty cool and uh, we're also usually trying to make the last level uh, not the hardest one I mean the last uh, in the level box which is basically like each 25 uh, each one of those have 25 levels the hardest level is usually the one uh, before the last one and the purpose of the last one is uh, it, it serves directly to the goal of, uh, of keeping players hungry for more. It's usually not very hard uh, not to avoid causing any frustrations, but it's really inventive. We're trying to keep some really cool idea to the, to the, uh, to the last level within the box, and it should basically communicate to the player that uh, the, the best part is still waiting ahead and uh, that we haven't run out of ideas. And another thing that proves that we haven't run out of ideas are the new gameplay elements that we add. And from the very beginning, um, with the every update, we've set a quite high bar of expectations by adding new gameplay elements with every update. And uh, we wasn't sure how, how many of those we would be able to come out, but so far we've been quite uh, cool inventing those. Uh, and our process of coming out with those uh, gameplay elements, that, that really changed the mechanics, by the way, in, in many cases. It's, well, the process is quite, quite um, traditional we brainstorm we pick the ideas we like most we try drafting the levels uh, on the paper uh, to understand whether it will you know it we will be able to create some cool set of the levels based on that then we prototype it and uh, you know tweak the parameters start creating the level the levels and put the final art and from the very beginning uh, the logic for adding new elements for us was to add more directional freedom to the candy so there was a gravity affecting, obviously pulling the candy down. So we needed something that would move it up. So here goes the bubble. And then we need some horizontal freedom as well. And we add the air cushions. And what, what's also cool about them and what we're trying to keep with all elements that we add, that those are intuitive and fun to interact. So it's fun to pop the bubbles. It's uh, fun to uh, click on the air cushions because they make farting sounds. And uh, stuff like this, it's, it's really cool. Uh, it, it's important to keep the game entertained. entertaining. All right, so um, another, so adding new stuff is cool. But we also have a luxury um, to learn from, like each time we add, add new stuff and, 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 up, and do new update, we, we can and we should learn and analyze what we did right, what we did wrong. And uh, not only we can use this knowledge to you know, while adding new stuff, we can also look at the existing stuff and maybe tweak it a bit, maybe improve it, maybe change it. There's some controversy about changing the levels um, in the game after they're being released. We feel it's okay to do it uh, if it you know keeps the if it doesn't harm the scores of the players and if it's if we're not going too wild with that. So to understand what needs to be changed, we're using several sources of information. And one of them, uh, of course, being uh, user reviews. This is a great uh, channel to receive the feedback overall. And uh, you can quite often see also the feedback about the levels. Like this one saying that the level 9 in one damn box is impossible. Why would you do this to me? And if we see you know, like several of those, there's obviously something wrong with that level. right? Another great thing is uh, to have um, players as fans on your Facebook page. Uh, not only it brings uh, some marketing possibilities, but also it's a great way to to communicate, to like uh, talk to your players 
And uh, we're also from time to time asking some things that help us to make decisions on uh, how we move forward and how we maybe improve the existing stuff. Surprisingly, Game Center can be also used as a statistics tool. So we keep uh, leaderboards for each one of the level boxes in the game. And we can see, in this case, the amount of weekly submitted scores for each of the level box. So this way, we can see that obviously not all players uh, leave, uh, reach the very latest levels of the game. We have plenty of those who have been updating for one and a half year. But still, we want uh, you know, as many players as possible to get to the end. So at some point, we rearranged the level boxes a bit. We took some levels, and we were able to, uh, to improve the percentage of the players that reach the end, the end of the game by 5%. It might, find, it might sound not like a big number, but considering the audience of the game, it, it's huge. And there's, of course, uh, like more complicated, more complex and uh, advanced ways of getting data, getting statistics, like Flurry. And uh, for level designers, the most important metrics are failing rate and uh, skipping rate, which we track for every level in the game. And basically, failing rate is, uh, is the amount uh, when players see the set face of unknown, when the candy gets broken, when it falls out of the screen, this kind of thing. So it, if this parameter is high, usually it means that players get the, they understand how to solve the level, but they can't execute it well. So it means that probably we need to simplify the arcade part of the level. If the skipping rate is too high, then probably uh, players like, can manage the, the difficulty, the, the timing uh, challenge of the level, but they just don't understand the, the puzzle component of it. So then we maybe should simplify it a bit or add some tip to the, to the level that would, start, uh, that would keep, help player to understand how to solve it. So, and it, it, it's really a tough balance, really. Uh, we, on the one side, we want as many players as possible to reach, to the, end, reach the very latest levels in the game, and then like impatiently waiting for updates. At the same time, we, of course, um, want to keep some challenge in the game. So it's a really uh, hard balance. And uh, we're trying to, to keep it, and we're trying to learn. And that's, that's one of our biggest challenge, challenges. So the results that we we, we, we got so far, as, as level designers, we created more than 900 levels, and less than half of them ended up in our games, obviously because we're trying to create more levels that we need, and then we pick the very best of them, um, and we put them in our games. And we're proud to constantly invent new things, new gameplay elements, and there have been already more than 22 of them added to the game. But the most important achievement, of course, and it directly serves the goals that I've uh, highlighted in the beginning, is that players want more. And uh, that pretty much fits the expectations of this little green guy. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Matt and I will get to answer the questions. There are microphones. Uh, I have one question. <coughs> so uh, in the updates of Calibro, uh, you said you, it's Data driven. So, uh, so, did you change any like existing data uh, levels? And how did you change that? Like so, like so, so that it doesn't affect the balance of the game or like the existing state data of the player. Uh, well, we, we're making sure that on the technical side there's no problems happening. Sometimes we like there's some bugs, of course, uh, uh, coming up, and we're like trying to fix them as fast as possible. But basically, it's, a, it's, it's more of a technical challenge. It, it, it can be solved pretty easily. Our, from the design perspective, the most important thing is that players would, wouldn't, wouldn't really be, get upset about this kind of change. And from our experience, they, they don't. They, they notice that maybe something has changed, but they're OK with it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I guess. I'd like to ask, uh, how just Sorry. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how you just came to the ideas of your games? I mean, the strains, this rope. And actually, about the rope, I'm not saying who is this guy. Sure. Sorry, how did we come up with the ideas for the games? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a funny thing. I, uh, I came up for the idea for Trainyard while I was riding a train to work. 
And so it's just like, wait a second, this would, uh, yeah, I, I really wanted to do something where there was uh, something to do with paint. I mean, there's no real paint in the game, but the idea of colors mixing together. And then it really felt like I was almost discovering the play mechanics rather than inventing them. It was just like, once I started looking, I was like, wow, there's like a whole lot of really interesting possibilities here. So, yeah. Yeah, and for Cut the Rope, um, we basically had the physics engine, the, the, the rope engine already in place. It was done for our previous game, but it never was used there. So then we started brainstorming of, like, about what can be the, the gameplay we can, we can build around that, that, that rope physics. And it, it was really a good starting point. We made several prototypes around the rope, and one of them was the, the best, and it ended up being the, the game. And this green thing? Oh, the green thing. Uh, it's just a product of many, many doodles, you know, and uh, experimenting, and uh, he, he really plays a big uh, role in the success of the game, I believe, because um, he's, he's kind of like a old baby monster, so he, in a way, he um, kind of encourages the parental feelings, so it's not, the, each level is not about getting some, some amount of score, but rather it's, you know, the, satisfying the needs of this little green, cute, uh, cute creature, so, the, the emotional relation, the, the emotional goal is much, um, much bigger than any you know, competitive goal. Thank you very much. Thanks. Over here. Hi. Um, I have a pretty picky question for Matt. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> I love train yard, um, but I noticed the, the color mixing trains don't follow the primary colors of light. And I just wondered if that was a deliberate decision on your part. Well, the, yeah, I've, I've had a few people complain about whether I should be using like subtractive or additive color systems. Um, I mean, the basic thing is just that people seem to understand uh, subtractive color systems more than additive. So the people seem to really understand the fact that blue plus yellow makes green rather than using like magenta and whatever. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was really the reason. People just seem to really associate with it. And I think part of it was just because of the fact that the game was really uh, originally was supposed to be about like these, these cars of paint and there was like a, a, almost like a paint crash on the middle of the railroad where these colors were mixing together. Yeah. Great, thanks. So Matt, you, uh, oops, sorry, am I, oh, there we go. You mentioned that uh, you'd created some levels that took you like up to eight hours to yeah. solve. I'm wondering uh, how do you go about making a puzzle that's hard for you yourself to solve, but not impossible? Like how do you know that you've created something that's still <laughs> solvable uh, while still challenging yourself. So the problem with Train Yard is that there's no way for me to really know whether something's solvable at all. So I, I would just literally just sit there and have kind of, uh, basically the, my first step is just to work it out mathematically, whether the colors add up and the number of trains add up. And then uh, just tr make this puzzle and try and solve it, and try and solve it, and try and solve it. And I've, I have a few, like a pile of puzzles that I've never been able to solve that are in my pile of like, Moby Dick puzzles that one day I will conquer. But yeah, it's, it's just really a process where I try to solve them, and sometimes I can't, and sometimes I can. Uh, how much time does a, a single puzzle take for a level designer to make, and how many level designers were working on the later levels of Cut the Rope? Um, it usually takes, I would say, several hours, like maybe two hours for, for the um, for the basic, like for the first iteration of the puzzle, and then of course when we have the full set of, of the of the puzzle for the level box, then we all play them, we do play testing, and then more iterations add. So it's like um, iterational process, and it's it's um, it's not that much related to some particular level, but it's rather looking at the levels as as a whole. And how many people work in the later levels of Cut, of cut the Rope? So we have, uh, uh, le uh, I think, three level designers at the moment working on the levels for our game. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome job. Uh, Samyan, when I saw, when you showed your spreadsheet, I saw you had a, a difficulty rating on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, in a pre-release state, before you have like, high volumes of playtesting, how do you get a reliable measure of difficulty? There is no reliable measure. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's exactly. a gut feeling, really. And uh, we were asking different people to play the, the levels and then put the difficulty number that they felt, how difficult it is. And then we were trying to calculate the average. But then, you know, you can't really, the, the, the trickiest part is then 
you can measure the difficulty of the, of the, of the arcade uh, gameplay, but with the puzzle, you have no idea. Like one person can come out with some solution right away, and some will spend like several hours, uh, you know, uh, completing it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is for uh, Train Yard. How do you determine the grid size, and how does that affect designing your levels? That's a good question. Um, so the story of Trainer is actually that it started out as a flash game, and originally it had an 8x8 grid. And then I never released the flash game. It was just like a prototype, basically. And then when I, I put it on iPhone, uh, 8x8 wasn't working. And I really liked the, the, uh, the kind of not quite balanced uh, of having that middle row with 7. Like, I really liked that for some reason. And um, yeah, so basically 7 worked really well with being something that your finger can actually go through the puzzles really. Was there a second part of the question, or that was the? Uh, well, actually, I guess, uh, wouldn't you make it bigger on the iPad, like maybe more grids, a bigger puzzle, or I mean, or we thought about in doing theory, that? yeah. Like the way the game works, adding even one row would would exponentially increase the amount of possibilities, which is a great thing. And I, I'm at some point, I may consider making a version that has uh, more rows. But yeah, it, it completely like the amount of possibilities with the seven by seven grid. Right now, there are, are over forty thousand player made puzzles and there's still like things that surprise me every day so the it's pretty crazy how much possibility there is there really I I was wondering um, what your total sort of development time was and if you're comfortable budget wise what these cost um, it's, it's a bit uh, tricky to say what the development time for cut the role because the physics engine and the rope engine were developed as a part of the previous project but uh, approximately it's around maybe a uh, four or five months, I would say. But that was the only the, only the initial game. You know, Since it's re it was released like one and a half year ago, we've been constantly working on, the, on it. So it, you can say that like four months and one and a half year. And as, yeah. as for the budget, working on Cut the Rope uh, was, we, we pretty much didn't have any budget. It, it was just a bunch of, of, of guys working from home back then and just doing what they like. I think that's it. All right. All right. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>